I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back along to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football family as ever. I'm your host, Harry Simiu, and on this edition of the show, we're going to be talking about some actual football, albeit not the greatest game of football that I've ever seen, uh, but we're going to be talking actual football. We're going to be reflecting on Arsenal's 1-1 draw at the Max Morlock Stadion against FC Nuremberg. Uh, lots of players to talk about. We're going to talk about Kai Havertz, who, of course, made his Arsenal debut. We'll be getting on uh, to that and discussing his position, which we've talked about at length before. I'm not saying I'm going to draw too many conclusions from a one-off friendly against Nuremberg, but I think there is a discussion to be had there. We're going to talk following Balogun. We're going to talk Ben White, Bukayo Saka. Uh, we're going to discuss basically how the game went and the big takeaways from it. Now, I know that the word on everybody's lips today is Declan Rice. I know that people are expecting an announcement with regards to Yuri and Timber today. So I know all of that is in the pipeline. And I know that transfer talk seems to dominate the airwaves at this time of year. But I really do, on this episode of the podcast, want to focus on the football and the takeaways from the game that we saw unfold yesterday. We will be back later on today, early evening, with a transfer show. So we're going to park the transfer talk for now, and we're going to focus solely on Arsenal's performance, what we learned from it, what we can take away uh, from the game at the Max Morlock Stadion and try uh, to make sense of, uh, of a lot of it. I know that, you know, often at this point in the year, it is predominantly about fitness. And I recognise that and I acknowledge that. So you're not going to catch me sort of really sticking the boot in on any of our players because performances at this point are obviously important because you want to get in a rhythm and you want to get going and you want to get into a place where, you know, you can go out there and you can compete uh, as soon as the season starts. But I think for me, it's about fitness. For me, it's about getting used to match situations. Again, dusting off the cobwebs, all the rest of it. I think that is what the key point is from it to take away from a game like this. But there were things on display that I think we can talk about and I think we can look at. And this is the thing with preseason, right? Preseason always ropes you in, doesn't it? Because you've missed watching your team play. You haven't seen your team play for so long. You know that there's players involved that you really want to take a look at. So in our case, this time, Kai Havertz would have been, I think for a lot of people, um, you know, right at the top of, of their list in terms of players that they wanted to see. You're going to want to take a look at people like Flo Balogun, who spent some time out on loan, did very, very well and has come back into the picture. And now there's an ongoing debate within the Arsenal fan base as to whether or not Arsenal should keep him or Arsenal should uh, look to move him on and cash in based on what he achieved last season. So those narratives and those stories that are a real key part of the window, they make games like this one seem really, really appealing before they start. And then they start. And you realise that nobody's at the fitness level required, with the exception of maybe one or two players who, who actually look sharp, in my opinion. You realise that the quality is going to be awful. You realise that the level of the opponent isn't particularly appealing either, uh, particularly in this game against Nuremberg. And basically, you think this is shit and why am I spending my time watching this? I always feel like that with preseason friendlies. It's very, very rare that I come away from a preseason friendly and feel any other way. You also know, particularly at this stage of preseason, that the likelihood of the big players, the big boys, the ones that you're desperate to see participating in the entire game is, is very low. And so you know that at some point, normally at half time at this stage of preseason, as we saw yesterday, there will be a raft of changes that will, again, negatively impact the quality of the game. So the buzz is there. The interest is there because it's preseason. I know a lot of people were unhappy at the fact that Arsenal were charging for this game. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd spoken to my dad, who obviously is a season ticket holder, but I don't think was aware going into yesterday that the game was behind a paywall and was quite disappointed when he found out it was. Still paid for it, obviously. Still watched it, obviously. 
um because we do that don't we we um we we sort of have that dying kind of like need to watch that we will eventually after the moaning subsides just go on and watch it but i'm not saying it's right i think yeah we had this conversation yesterday on the podcast and whilst i don't want to be critical of anyone you know or or you know make a big thing of this i i do think that you know it could have been um given to members in particular uh, particularly those that are paying for memberships at the club already but anyway um let's get on to the game then so let's talk first of all about the starting 11 uh, that Mikel Arteta picked because it was a, a much stronger 11 than I expected him to start with. I have to say that. He went with Ramsdale in goal. He went with White, Saliba, Gabriel and Kivior across the back line. He initially picked Partey, Trossard and Odegaard in midfield. But of course, um, Odegaard had to pull out picked up a knock in the uh, in the warm up uh, which meant that he couldn't play the front three was made up of Saka Nelson and Enketia when i looked at that team i thought wow you know Mikel means business here and we've talked a lot haven't we in recent weeks about the the need to get into preseason from the very beginning and and to really sort of value it because it does set the tone in a lot of ways when you start the season now I can come up with examples of seasons where we had great results in preseason, dreadful start to the Premier League. Equally, you can find examples of times where it's been the other way around. Really good um, in preseason, really poor when we start, or or really poor in preseason and really good where we start. It it, it happens, right? So although you shouldn't read into these r- results too much, it does help build confidence. It does help set the rhythm uh, for the season that you're about to kick off. So I looked at that team and I thought that's a really, really strong team. Obviously, I'm fortunate that Martin Odegaard had to miss out. From what I understand, there is nothing to be too concerned about. There hasn't really been any information on the extent of this injury or this knock that he picked up. But we also haven't heard anything to cause us to feel particularly alarmed by this. So no need to panic on that just yet. And fingers crossed with, what, a week to go until our first game in the United States. We'll be able to get Martin Odegaard back into the picture so that he can work his way back to full sharpness because he is a really, really key player for us. But anyway, he came out the side and was replaced, as I say, by Fabio Vieira in the starting eleven. Now, the game started for Arsenal really, really well. Seven minutes in, Arsenal take the lead. A trademark Bukayo Saka goal coming in off that right-hand side, just dropping the shoulder to buy himself that half a yard and looking up and firing into that far corner with his stronger left foot. And he's getting more and more clinical, you feel, in those situations. He's becoming more and more impactful. And, you know, in the past, we always knew that Bukayo Saka could cut in and and had the capability to provide and produce really good finishes. But now we're seeing it most of the time. And that is a real sign of how he's progressed as a footballer on an individual level. We completely dominated the first half. I thought we controlled... Uh, the first half really, really well. Um, I thought Ben White in particular really, really stood out. I think he looked among the sharpest, defended well, combined with Saka really well. Uh, I thought it was really, really impressive. Saka too was one of the players that stood out. I know that he didn't have as long a break as some of the others because obviously he was playing for England, uh, performed really well on international duty. It doesn't look like the short break he has had has affected his momentum too much. But the second half was really disappointing. Um, And again, I I go back to the point I made right at the start of the show, which was I expected this. I expected there to be wholesale changes. And when you make wholesale changes, you disrupt. And when you disrupt, you often impact the level of the football and you impact the level of the game. Um, Yeah, the, the, the changes made at the break were Hein. Havertz, Jesus, Cedric, Tierney and Jorginho. Those guys came on to replace Ramsdale, Partey, Saka, Saliba, Kivior and Nelson. Before I I go on to the second half in a little bit more detail, I should have done this bit before. But for me and sort of on my notes in front of me, I've circled his name. To see William Saliba come back into the side is, is really, really positive. Because... Although when we first heard about his injury, 
at the back end of last season, we we thought it wasn't that serious and he'd be back quite quickly. The fact that we thought he was coming back and then he didn't, and then we thought he might be back again and he didn't make it that time either. Because that uh, of the nature of how that situation unfolded, there was a part of me that really feared that this was a really, really serious injury. Um, and, and actually, there was a part of me that wondered if he was going to be okay for the start of the new season. To see him start a game, okay, he played 45 minutes, fine. But to see him start a game and look okay and come through it okay for me was massive because he was such a big, important part of why we were better last season. He played such a key role at centre-back alongside Gabriel. And there was that image going around on social media of the two of them just sort of standing side by side. They are back. The boys are back. Amazing to see. Um, that was a, a big... Uh, a big plus for me, even before the game started. It didn't really matter what happened for me in terms of Saliba's performance, because as we've talked about, it's pre-season. But to see him on the pitch starting a game was was a real big boost. Um, the second half started, Arsenal not as good. No question about it. Balogun got on 55 minutes in, I think. Um, and then later on, we saw uh, Nuaneri and Austin Trusty come on to replace Fabio Vieira. Uh, and uh, and Gabriel centre back. We're going to talk about individual players in a little bit because um, I, I did make some notes on some players that I just wanted to highlight and, and discuss a little bit. So I'm not glossing over individual performances. We will come on to them in a minute. But on 62 minutes, Nuremberg equalised, and it was a Jorginho own goal, and it was it was it was laughable the way we we conceded that goal. Now. Again, I'm not going to go in too hard. I'm not going to be too upset about it because of the circumstances and because of the nature of the match. But the more I watch it, the more I can't make sense of, of what on earth was going on there. Carl Hein, in theory, is doing what Mikel Arteta would probably want our goalkeeper to do, which is receive the ball on the edge of the penalty area, put your foot on it, invite the press, your two centre-halves to spread out right and left, giving you options, but also for his midfielders to drop into those holes and receive the ball. That's one of the main ways in which we've been able to beat presses this season. Aaron Ramsdale, really comfortable on the ball for a goalkeeper, really good at doing that, generally speaking. But he's made mistakes too. Mistakes happen and mistakes should be expected when you are asking your team to play that way. But you always feel like with somebody like Carl Hine, who doesn't get that many opportunities, when he does get them, he's almost got to be flawless to give himself any chance of breaking into the team. And you feel for him a little bit because the pass he chose, I thought was the wrong one into Jorginho. But equally, what the hell was Jorginho doing? Was that a, a, an attempt to control the ball? Was that an attempt to pass it back to somebody else? Like I, I, I've watched it five, six times over and over again, and I just cannot work out for the life of me what Jorginho's intention was there. And maybe he gets caught in two minds. But anyway, the ball ends up in the back of our own net. And Nuremberg, having done basically nothing, were back on level terms. And again, it's preseason and you shouldn't stress too much about these things. But you don't want these mistakes to be happening. You don't want them to become the norm. And again, I'll, I'll refer back to the point that the wholesale changes at the break for me were a, a clear indication of what was going to come in the second half, which was going to be a drop off. Now you look at the players. That came on, Kai Havertz, you know, Jesus, Tierney, you know, really, really good players. You could argue upgrades on the players that they replaced. But you know that Jorginho is not really at parte level. Um, you know, you know that Cedric is not going to do um, wonderful things on the right necessarily. So, yeah, you've um, you, you, you kind of got to just accept that this is what happens when you make those changes and when you bring in players that haven't had all that much game time. Um, we did have chances to win it, though, and it was perhaps a little bit disappointing that we didn't. More from a, a sort of individual perspective when it comes to Flo Balogun, because he came on and, and we talked recently about how big this game and the US tour would be for him on an individual level in terms of trying to convince Mikel Arteta or staking his claim for a place in the side. You know, there's no reason why by the end of preseason, he can't have shown Mikel Arteta that he is ahead of Eddie Nketiah, for example, which then makes him the second in line in terms of playing at centre-forward, which then changes the whole perspective. 
and and changes the picture and maybe changes changes the lens through which he looks at his Arsenal career. So I think that the next few games are big in that sense. And I really, really wanted him to put one of those efforts away. He had that shot from the angle, which came off of the post. Um, and he, uh, of course, rounded the goalkeeper on 90 minutes and, and somehow hit the side netting. He had the goal at his mercy. And given the confidence levels that he showed throughout last season, I was I was a bit disappointed that he wasn't able to take those chances. But I said we were going to talk about individual performances because I don't think the the overall and the collective performance is something that we really need to spend too much time on, given the nature of the game. But there are a few players that I wanted to chat about. Nwaneri and Lewis Skelly obviously coming on as well. Um, neither really done anything magical, but I thought both looked really, really sharp and at the very least showed that they deserve to be there. And I think that's all you can do at that age and, and at that status when you're coming into a squad like Arsenal. So fair play to those two lads. I wanted to talk a little bit about Kai Havertz. And I've purposely dodged the Kai Havertz chat up until this point because I feel like we need to have a bit of a conversation about this. And it was worth uh, more than just a gloss over. When we signed Kai Havertz, or when it was rumoured that we were going after Kai Havertz, when it first came to light that Arsenal had contacted Chelsea over uh, the potential of signing Kai Havertz, those of you that are members on the Chronicles of Aguna podcast over on the Another Slice platform will have remembered me putting out a piece talking about where Kai Havertz fits in, why he'd be a good signing for Arsenal, and, and what positions I'd expect him to cover. When he did eventually come in and the transfer was done and the deal was signed, sealed, delivered, all the rest of it, Arsenal, in their announcement, featured a couple of lines from Mikel Arteta in which he said he adds options to our midfield, which backed up a lot of the, the conversations and a lot of the claims that many Arsenal journalists and, and reporters had suggested, which was that he was being brought in to play as the left eight. And I, I said on that episode that I don't see him as a left eight. And over time, I've tried to kind of get my head around how he could possibly come in and do the job that Granit Xhaka did. And it's not because he's less talented than Granit Xhaka, but in terms of his profile, it's completely different, which means that you're going to have to change, tweak the way you play. And we started the game, obviously, with Vieira and with Trossard in the two eight positions. Which, I guess, is an indicator of where Arteta wants to go in terms of his midfield setup. That he does want to have two more attack-minded players in there rather than one who's kind of half and half in Granit Xhaka and then another in Martin Odegaard who's purely forward-thinking or predominantly forward-thinking, I should say. But then there was a part of me that thought, well, maybe he just picked those guys because they're the ones that have enough minutes in the tank and that's the way he's going to do it. And it's not really an indicator of how we're going to start the new season. But anyway, over the last few weeks, I've been trying to convince myself that Havertz can play in the left eight role. And although I'm still going to give him the benefit of the doubt and I'm not going to jump to too many dramatic conclusions just yet, I think yesterday was an example of how if he is going to play that role going forward, he's still got a lot of learning to do. And he's got a lot of work to do in terms of making himself familiar with that role. He's not that player for me. He's somebody who operates in between the lines. He's somebody who um, is very, very technical. He's somebody that can come across as looking a little bit pedestrian at times, although I don't think that is the case with Kai Havertz. I just, uh, for me, he's a a sort of false nine, left-sided, right-sided, attacking midfielder, or you could play him centrally through the midfield as well, but with that license to get forward and, and as I say, work in between the lines. So I'm still struggling on a personal note to to work out how this is going to work. And, and if it is going to work, it's going to mean a tweak in our shape and in our system, whereby we are now playing with two midfielders who predominantly focus on attack. So, yeah, um, I don't think his performance needs sort of too much criticism because I think it's a bit harsh. And, you know, he's come on for a half in his first ever friendly for the club and he's still got to get used to everybody around and, and he's still got to understand the instructions that Mikel Arteta is sending his way, all the rest of it. 
Um, but yeah, it, it just just watching him yesterday, it just raised questions for me again about whether this thing or this idea, this theory of playing Havertz as the left eight is actually going to work in reality. I also want to talk a little bit about Flo Balogun. Um, as we mentioned, he had a couple of really, really big chances and and we talked about how important it is for him to um, to impress at this stage and to kind of stake a claim moving forward. Um, but although I, I sort of mentioned this before, I mentioned the chances and talked about the importance of him producing in these next few games because of how it could change the situation he finds himself in. My opinion on Flo Balligan as a player isn't different to what it was on Wednesday because I acknowledge and I accept that this is a one-off situation. It's a one-off game. And, um, you know, he's been away from the team for a long time. He hasn't been training with the boys for a long time. And Mikel went on to say a little bit later on, didn't he, that, um, you know, some of these players had only had three training sessions. So how much can you really, really expect? I think there is a couple of positional myths, though, that we need to talk about um, that that keep popping up that I think actually need addressing. So uh, the Havertz one we've touched on, is he a left eight? Still not for me. Um, and I need to be convinced otherwise. The other one I wanted to highlight when I sort of jotted down on my notepad, positional myths, was Jakob Kivior. I thought when he came in last season at right centre-back, which is obviously not his right side, he prefers to play on the left, being a left-footed player. I thought he did a good job. I thought he did an admirable job. And I thought that he had really come on leaps and bounds to the point where, you know, not necessarily going to be a starter going into this season, but he's someone that can fight for a place. And he's someone that you look at and you think is good enough cover, a really valuable member of the squad, all of the rest of it. And because of the way that Mikel sort of shuffled the pack a little bit in the last few games, once the title was gone, people had been saying to me that actually he can cover at left back. And not only is he a centre back, but he's a left back as well. And again, that was another one that just normally, right, when I look at a player and I'm not blowing smoke up my own ass, okay, so please don't take this in that way. When I look at a player, I normally look at the position that they play in. And then when someone says to me, oh, they can play in X position too, it needs to kind of make sense in my mind for me to believe it. And then once it makes sense in my mind, I need to see it in action. And I need to see that position being carried out by that player for me to be like, oh yeah, this is a good solution. Let's move forward with it. We're having a lot of this chat with Timber as well. Where's he going to play? Is he a right back? Is he a center back? Someone's talking about defensive midfield. As a center back, absolutely, because that's where he played all 32 of his Eredivisie appearances for Ajax last season, not a problem. As a right centre-back in a back three, can he do that? I think he can. We've seen that before on the international stage with the Netherlands. Can he play as a conventional right-back? I'm not 100% sure about that. I need to see that in practice. I think it makes sense in my mind because of his build and all the rest of it. No problem, but I need to see that in action. Jakob Kivio, for me, however much you want to praise him for what he managed to produce at the back end of last season and the way he came in at a time where things had seemingly gone to shit, all the rest of it, he's not a left back. And he seemed to try and play the Zinchenko role yesterday of, you know, stepping into that midfield trio and, and being a part of that. And he just looked really, really uncomfortable at times. And again, this is not a criticism of Jakob Kivio or, or me having a go at him as an individual, because I think he's a good player, but he's not a left back. And he's definitely not an inverted left back. He might be a defensive left back. We've seen centre halves move over to full back at times in their careers to do specific jobs on specific players, but then be quite limited actually because they are centre backs by nature in how they go forward. But to say that Jakob Kivior is not only got the qualities to adapt into a fullback when we're in a defensive shape, but also then shape shift into a midfielder, which Zinchenko kind of half is and go and play that inverted role as well, I think is a lot to ask of him. And I, and I don't really see that working. Um, so yeah, a couple of positional myths for me. The Kivior thing is not a left back. Forget about it. And also, I'm still on the fence about the Xhaka thing. He, he just, 
you know, it's not a judgment based on yesterday, but I, the jury is out on that for me. Let's have a look at some of the comments that Mikel Arteta made post-match. Um, we are going to talk Fabio Vieira in a second. Do you know what? Actually, let's do Fabio Vieira now because I can see you guys bringing it up in the chat. Fabio Vieira has divided opinion for a little while now, and I think this is a big, big season for him because he's got to prove to a lot of people that he's good enough for this football club. We spent a, a substantial amount of money on him, more than you know maybe felt reasonable at the time, given his profile at the point we signed him. But clearly Arsenal see something in this guy and clearly there's something that Arsenal like about him. I think technically he's superb. And I actually think that for all the criticism he's got online off the back of yesterday's game, he was probably one of the only players that was able to progress the ball forward, break lines and had that sort of forward thinking, you know, on a regular basis during the game. Not every pass came off. Not every idea came off, but he was always looking to progress the ball forward. And I can't always say that about some of the others. I, I think, you know, Jorginho at times can be progressive, but I think a lot of the time he's, his first thought is not to be progressive. Unless Mikel's going to be able to coach that into him, we are going to see Jorginho from time to time sort of revert back to type, which is the, the kind of player that he's always been. And that's fine. But we need that penetration and we need that sort of line breaking strategy. And I think Fabio Vieira gives you that. So I don't really understand the criticism that he got. I'm not saying that he's going to make it. I'm not saying that he's going to blow up onto the scene next season or anything like that. But I don't really understand why people have come away from that game of all games and are wanting to stick the boot in further on a player who I think needs our love and support. And with the love and support of his teammates and his coach and given the right opportunities, I think certainly has the ability to come good. Anyway, let's take it on to Mikel Arteta's comments before we wrap up. Uh, he said that there were lots of positives in the first half, uh, the fitness levels that the boys showed. He talked about the big chances that Arsenal, of course, had to win the game, but he did go on to say that mistakes are a part of football. And I guess at both ends of the pitch, referring to the Carl Hein thing uh, involving Jorginho and, uh, and of course, um, you know, looking at the fact that Arsenal couldn't go around uh, or, or go down the other end and win the game despite having a couple of chances to do so. He highlighted the fact that a lot of the players had only had three training sessions. He talked about how unlucky we were to have picked up a few knocks uh, along the way as well. Uh, a couple of other players uh, not available, not just Martin Odegaard who pulled that in the warm-up. And on Havertz, he said uh, that he was feeding in well with the group, that he's a good character, tremendous player. And then we've got a big talent in the German. So he's still really, really positive. Well, he would be at this stage, wouldn't he? He's positive about Kai Havertz. And I think a lot of us should stay positive about Kai Havertz. It's really easy to write him off at the first kind of corner because of what Chelsea fans say about him. But I think we've got to let him go out there and, and win us over himself and not allow what happened at Chelsea to cloud our judgment on the player and how he performs for Arsenal, uh, for our football club. Obviously, Mikel Arteta was asked about the transfers as well. Um, and he said that there's nothing to announce, but when there is, you'll be kind of the first to know. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to do a transfer show a little bit later on today. So we're not going to do questions now or, um, or or get caught in that loop of um, of transfer chat. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we will, of course, um, focus on the transfer news and take a ton of your questions on the show that we're going to be doing later on today. It'll probably be early evening, around about five-ish, I'd imagine. Uh, very, very much looking forward to that. And hopefully we get some kind of news or announcement in between this one and that one, because then we can talk about something rather than just sort of regurgitating some of the reports that have been going around. But um, those are kind of my thoughts on the game against Nuremberg, my takeaways from it. Uh, I think preseason does rope you in. It gives you an expectation because of, you know, it, it, it creates expectation because of how much you miss watching your team play. Inevitably, that expectation gets pissed on by the fact that the game's no good. And um, and then that makes you feel a little bit downbeat in comparison to how you felt at the start. But I think this one, more than any of the other friendlies that we're going to play, is about fitness. It's the first one. It's about you know, getting people back out on the pitch, as I said, at the right, right at the top of the show, dusting off the cobwebs, all the rest of it. And um, and I think we'll, we've got to look for patterns of play and 
you know, where people might fit in. We can't really do that now. We got to, we, we can start to look at those things, I think, in the next few games. But for now, it's just about fitness, just about getting minutes on the board and, and, and we move forward. And I think that you could tell by how relaxed Mikel Arteta looked post-match that he sees it like that too. You know, he is a very intense guy. And when Arsenal don't perform or get beaten, then he's genuinely upset about it. It normally comes across, even in friendlies, even in games that don't have huge significance. So if he's chilled, which I'm sure he is, then there's no need for us to go overboard about the fact that some of the moves that we made yesterday didn't quite come off. Um, a 1-1 one -one draw, it was a draw that we basically gifted Nuremberg. Otherwise, we win the game 1-0. And maybe the narrative post-match is a little bit different. But I would say don't focus too much on the result. Uh, we might go and beat Man United, Barcelona, whatever in, in America, 5-6-0. And yeah, it'd be positive and I'd, I'd enjoy it, obviously. But you're not going to get me saying, oh, well, that means we're going to go on and win the league. Because results in preseason are, you know, they can be positive if you you know build some kind of momentum and a head of steam going into the campaign. But they're also not defining. And that's uh, that's important to remember. Thank you guys uh, so, so much for tuning in to our review of the FC Nuremberg uh, versus Arsenal friendly. As I say, we'll be back later on uh, with uh, with a transfer show in which we will be. Um, in which we will be. Um, yeah, breaking down the latest news stories. Uh, well, hold on a second. I, what are these comments from. Uh, from. Where is it? There's a comment from Nav that just popped up on my screen. Was it from earlier? Uh, saying something like about forgiveness. What? <laughs> what have I done? Um, yeah, I, I completely missed that, wherever it was. But yeah, no, I haven't got no issue with anyone. Don't worry uh, <laughs> if that's what you're saying. Anyway, look, I'll catch you guys a little bit later on with another edition of the podcast. Subscribe, like, all the rest of it. You know the drill by now. It really, really does help. And I'll see you all soon. Until then, goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.